life and uh, also in provision of services. Now, just as I open up and start off the presentation, I need to highlight that um, sexual violence in children is something that is not um, um, initially um, uncommon. And unfortunately, for most of the cases that we come across, over 50% are actually persons who are well known to the children and um, are just next to them. It's not far. It can be from within the same household or from the neighborhood. So um, I'll start my presentation with um, just a few of uh, definitions before now um, we expand and um, move further. So um, when we talk of um, a survivor, we are referring to any person who has undergone violence. And um, in today's topic, we are looking at sexual violence and has been able to live through the experience. Now within the medical setting, many of the times you'll hear us refer to them as survivors and not victims. But when it moves to the issue of um, the legal system and the courts, you'll refer to, you'll hear them refer to them as victim. And also this is um, in reference with the Sexual Offenses Act. Now, when we, re when we talk about penetration, we are referring to partial or complete insertion of genital organs of a person or an object mm -hmm. into the genital organ of another. Defilement. When we talk about um, sexual violence in children, and uh, we are taking children to be any persons below the age of 18 as per the law. So defilement is any act that causes penetration of a child's uh, genital, genital organ. When we look at the genital organ, we are referring to either whole or part of the male or female genital organs. And for this purpose of the act of sexual violence, there is inclusion of the anus. Designated persons, as per the SOA, this is either a nurse or a clinical officer who's registered under the various laws and acts of parliament. Now you'll be able to see that when we are having um, the P3 form, it talks about the um, Due to the SOA, there was need to also have these other cadres being able to now fill in the, P, the um, PRC form and be able just to you know, assist in the justice system and make things move further, faster. We have the history um, form, and this is a document that should be filled in triplicate by the medical practitioner or either the designated person for purposes of medical legal documentation following sexual violence. So even as we see these children, there is the uh, medical history that we take and documentation, but it only becomes complete when now you have this PRC form and um, also the P3 form, which will now be able to also aid when we are looking at the legal, um, the legal bit. Now, I want to move to data. And I just want to share with you um, this data that we're able to um, get from HIS. And looking back from um, 2018 to last month. So when we look at the cases of survivors that we managed to see within the hospital setting, in 2018, we had a total of 11,454 reported um, cases of uh, sexual violence. In 2019, this increased to 13,513. And in uh, last year, it even increased further because of you know, all those associ associated issues that were there with uh, you know, the COVID pandemic, it rose to 19,615. 
Now this year, only up to last month, the reported number of cases we stand at 2,162. Uh, so you can see over the years from 2018, 2019 to 2020, we are just having increased um, number of cases that are coming to access care and we're able to capture through the reporting system, the health information reporting system. Now I want to move further. Today's topic is looking at children and uh, we just want to correlate these figures. We have been able, I've been able to uh, extract this um, data mm -hmm. showing the number of um, survivors that is children, male and female, and then using the different um, age sets of 0 to 11 and um, 12 to 17. So when we look in the year 2012 and just compare with, uh, I mean, 2018, we compare to 2019 and 2020, we can see and appreciate that we are having more of the, of the girls um, as compared to the boys within the same, the same age, age sect of zero to 11. Now, when we move to the older, that is 12 to 17, still we are having more of the girls being affected than the boys. And uh, when we translate these numbers into mm -hmm. a comparison to the previous slide, you'll be able to see that out of the 11,454 cases that were reported in 2018, approximately 8,000 were actually children. In 2019, of the 13 mm -hmm. cases, we have approximately 10,000 being children. And last year, out of the 19 reported cases, we have approximately 14,000. So you can actually be able to see um, the magnitude of this issue and how um, our children are being affected by um, um, this voice. Then we move to the next slide, which now, sorry, it's a little bit um, squeezed up and looking congested, but this is just um, a slide that I felt it's important to share so that we can be able to mm -hmm. see as a program, the interventions that we do at facility level, how successful are we? And what raised an alarm for me is the issue of um, the legible survivors who are initiated on PEP and those who completed the PEP. So if we look at 2018, those who are legible for and initiated on PEP, we had 9,000. But those who completed PEP stood at 3,876. So where have we lost these 5,000 plus persons? 2019 still is the same. Those who were initiated, 9,300. Those who completed, 3,800. So we still, the numbers should actually be a replica of the other. Those initiated should be the same as those who are completed. Is it that we are not canceling them very well for them to appreciate and be able to complete the, the PEP. So I just felt it was important to highlight this slide for us so that uh, we can see what is it that we are not doing right or what is it that we can improve better so as to be able to have all these interventions that we are doing to have um, a successful rate out of it. Now, when we move to the next slide, as a division, we have several policy documents and uh, data recording tools that we use to capture this information. Now we have our national guide on the management of sexual violence, which is the third edition. Um, it is long overdue for revision and um, we are actually having to revise it um, this year. We have planned to have it revision. We also have uh, the most recent document on the forensic module management on uh, sexual gender-based violence, um, which we developed and um, had it signed and ready for use in September last year. Now what um, brought to this document was that 
Yes, healthcare workers were undergoing the five days uh, training on the management of sexual violence. But when it comes to issues around forensics, sample collection, preservation, and um, being able to have it move from one uh, sector to another, there was a very big gap. So what was recommended was for us to expound the forensic module of this management of sexual violence and be able to create content so that we make the healthcare workers now have skills, know what they're supposed to do when it comes to forensic. And when you look at the nature of the training, we have different departments that we reach out to for us to be able to do this uh, training. We have people from government chemists, we have people from DCI, the um, ODPP, um, guys from the uh, judiciary. So as just to be able to strengthen and for healthcare workers to appreciate, we are just not working within the health space. There's what we do within the health space that connects and influences or affects mm -hmm. these other sectors where these samples are moving. And the end of it, looking at um, issues of the legal system and justice to the survivor. Now, when we are working, we are looking at being able to offer the highest quality of care. And um, we were able to come up with the Kenya Health Sector Gender-Based Violence Services um, Quality Assurance Tool. Now, this is a tool that facilities are able to use to assess, one, their preparedness when it comes to gender-based violence services. Two, what gaps do they have? How can they be able to address these gaps so as to be able to improve the quality of care that we offer around uh, gender-based violence? We have our um, MY363 form, which is the uh, post rep care form. We have the um, summary tool, the 364. Now this summary tool of 360, 364 has got more indicators as compared to the 711 that is there. And we want to encourage healthcare workers to be able to fill in also the 364 because as a program, as a division, it's able to speak for us in terms of the interventions that um, are being done. Is it, are we successful? Are we moving in the right direction or where do we need to strengthen? Then we have the register, the 365, MOH 365, which is the SGBV register. Now when, come, when it comes to coordination and partnership, as a division, we hold a quarterly um, committee of experts meetings. These were previously referred to as the technical working group meetings. And here we have several um, stakeholders who participate in this, uh, in this meeting. We have the Ministry of Health with the different divisions and departments in it. We have the Ministry of Education, we have the State Department of Gender, we have the police, we have the government chemist, judiciary, we have um, WHO, UNICEF, UNFPA, UNAIDS, quite a number of um, um, the stakeholders who participate in our uh, COE. And not forgetting, most important, the academia. Now, um, following a cabinet memo, there was need to escalate and fast track the issues of response to GBV so as to be mm -hmm. able to match with the uh, presidential commitment of having um, zero um, GBV. And uh, there was a multi agency technical committee that was set up. Uh, we have the Ministry of Health, we have Ministry of um, uh, Public Service and Gender, Ministry of Interior and Coordination of National Government, the National Treasury and Planning, Ministry of Labor and Social Protection, the East African Community and Regional Development. We are not forgetting Ministry of Education, Office of the Director of Public uh, Prosecution, and Ministry of ICT Innovation and Youth Affairs. Now, this same um, multi-agency technical committee is the same one also that is working towards um, elimination of FGM. So they have been tasked to look into those two um, issues. Now, it is important for us to note that um, the Kenyan law um, entails uh, medical care to survivors, 
of sexual violence, as well as suspects, convicts, or witnesses of um, sexual offenses. So at times you may get um, in our um, trainings, when we interact with healthcare workers, you'll get that some of the healthcare workers feel like um, only the survivors should be, you know, uh, given medical care and not the suspects or the perpetrators, but by law, they all are entitled to medical care. And uh, it's always important to always get informed assent from the child and also consent from the parent or caregiver. When we do examination of this child, we need to do a full examination head to toe so that we can be able to pick out all the necessary um, things that would help us be able to help this child um, medically and also be able to fill in the necessary mm -hmm. documentation that we need to do as healthcare uh, providers. There is need to take medical and uh, forensic specimens at the same time, because it is traumatizing to have uh, specimens taken today, and then three days down the lane, you want to start struggling and you know go in and start taking uh, forensic specimens. So when we look at specimen collection, let us have both medical and forensic specimens being collected at the same time. Documentation is quite key. All that is done needs to be documented in the, in the medical notes, in the PRC form, the P3 form, and the register. We still identify gaps when it comes to documentation. And unfortunately, it affects when it comes to um, the end line, when we are now looking into the courts. We have had incidences where um, medical records, um, documentation in the P3, uh, PRC form do not um, correlate. And those gaps are what now lead the, the magistrate to dismiss and free a perpetrator. So we really emphasize on issue of documentation. Now, when it comes to history taking, the caregiver or someone who's acquainted with the child will be able to give us history. Where we have an older child, the child himself or herself will be able to give us history. Now, when we are dealing with adolescents, they are often shy, embarrassed to talk about matters of sexual nature, and it only takes um, a good clinician to be able to identify this and just encourage them to be able to, you know, talk more freely, allow them to be seen alone. We can have their, um, you know, parent or uh, caregiver being able to stand outside and then the clinician and the, uh, the adolescent are left in the room and they'll be able to um, talk more freely. Now, um, we start with general and unthreatening questions just to create rapport. And then we move to questions that are now specific to, to the incidents. This just helps the child to be a little bit uh, comfortable and open up. Key to note is that very small children, we want to encourage the examination when they are on their mother's or caregiver's lap. If the child still refuses, the examination may be deferred or even abandoned. We don't force examination, especially if there are no reported symptoms of injuries because findings will be minimal and this coercion may actually represent yet another form of violence and uh, traumatization to the child. Now, there are cases where we consider sedation or use of general anesthesia um, if the child has refused examinations and uh, how the child has presented requires urgent medical attention. For example, if the child is bleeding or there's a foreign body that is uh, suspected or that is there, so we'll be able to use uh, sedation as we manage the child. Now I mentioned about us having a head to toe examination of this child. Definitely we'll take the weight of the child, but one of the um, areas that um, at times are overlooked because when a child comes and the caregiver um, talks of this child has been sexually um, violated, quickly 
do healthcare workers want to run to the genital area? Forgetting that at times you may have some injuries in the mouth or pharynx, you may get some petechial kind of uh, bleeding or spots on the palate, on the posterior of the pharynx, or even on the buccal mucosa, yeah, in the mouth. We need to also look for tears um, um, beneath there the frenulum, yeah, below the below the tongue. So these are areas that are times that are forgotten. Now, when we are examining children, girls to be specific, when we are doing the genital anal examination, where possible, don't do the speculum exam on girls who have not reached puberty. It may be painful and cause additional trauma, but where it is indicated, for example, if the child has got some bleeding that is arising from, the vagin from vaginal injury as a result of uh, penetration, um, help assist the child to lie on the back, use a pediatric speculum and conduct the examination under anesthesia when the child is relaxed and you're able to pick out um, quite important things. Check for blood spots or trauma also to the urethra. Uh, don't forget to examine the anus for bruises, tears or discharge. For the boys, we check for injuries on the skin that connects the foreskin to the penis. Check for any discharge that may be there from the urethral meters. In older boys, you may pull back the foreskin if they're not uh, um, circumcised to examine the penis. Do not force because it may cause trauma, more so to the younger boys. Help the boy to lie on the back or on his side and examine the anus for bruises, tears, or discharge. Avoid examining the boy in a position in which he was violated, as this may mimic the position of abuse and re-traumatize the, the boy child. When it comes to investigations, we do investigations for well-being and also for forensics, sample collection. So for urine, we'll do a urinalysis, Check, <clears throat> be able to see if there's any um, spermatozoa in the urine. We check for spermatozoa. Do a pregnancy test for the girl, the adolescent girl. Do the anal swab, the high vaginal mm -hmm. swab, the oral swab for evidence of spermatozoa, if there. For the blood, carry out the HIV tests. Be able to do LFTs, VDRL and um, even hepatitis B. Now, when it comes to management, we manage any physical injuries. We will give tetanus toxoid. We will give the um, um, PEP pregnancy prevention. We'll manage any STIs or give prophylaxis. And here we, we are looking at administering um, suffixin and um, azithromycin to the child and um, also um, for the hepatitis B, I think uh, since the um, introduction of the pentavalent vaccination mm -hmm. that has brought the hepatitis B, if the child has received the three doses, then that should be able to give um, lifetime um, immunity to the child. Now, when we are looking at the follow-up of this child, remember we have that initial visit that the child and the caregiver has come, we would like to see them two weeks thereafter. And uh, within these two weeks, we want to assess issues of adherence to treatment previously given. So if it is the issue of PEP, you don't just directly ask, you just want to find out how many tablets of, PEP, of the, the um, antiretrovirals have remained. So if you get that the caregiver talks of some number of tablets, then you can be able to see that adherence was not well. Or if they tell you that they have completed the two weeks um, tablets that you gave, then you can be able to also tell that at least they have adhered to um, the treatment that you gave. We evaluate for any STIs and treat if necessary. We also evaluate mental and emotional status, treat or refer as needed also provide adherence and trauma counseling. We need to strengthen issues around mental and emotional um, um, status and um, you know, 
support to this child, generally also to adults who have been violated. That is one area where there are gaps. Maybe it is because of the skill of the provider, but also looking into what are the referral networks that have been identified where now uh, further referrals for you know, trauma counseling can be done to um, the survivor. So the third visit, we will have the child come in four weeks down the lane. So you check if they've completed the PEP. Um, you also repeat uh, PDT and refer for care if necessary for the adolescent girls. And then uh, do follow up uh, vaccination as it need be. Evaluate for STIs and treat if necessary. And also look into having an evaluation of the mental and emotional status. Now you'll be able to see that for each visit, we always are recommending evaluating the mental and emotional status and being able to refer where need be or be able to um, address issues that would have been identified. Also continue with the trauma counseling. Remember counseling is a process, it's not just a one-off. So each time they come, they need to have their counseling session, the trauma counseling session. For the first, fourth visit, which is uh, six weeks down the line, we evaluate for STI still and treat if necessary. The mental and emotional status, we also look into that and provide the trauma counseling. Now, fifth visit is at three months. And here would want to retest for HIV and refer for care if necessary. We still would evaluate for STIs and treat if necessary. Still evaluate the mental and emotional status. So treat or refer where need be and still provide trauma counseling. So you may get that there are some of the um, survivors that we see even at the fifth visit, not all may may now be okay mentally, yeah? There are some that may still require a little bit more follow-up when it comes to the trauma counseling. So based on the counselor's assessment, they will be able to uh, still reschedule, but for majority of them, by the, five, the fifth visit, they usually tend to um, now be at least at ease mentally mm -hmm. and emotionally. Now, um, when we look at children survivors of uh, sexual violence, the children will rarely disclose sexual abuse immediately after the event. And when you look at the um, issues surrounding, you know, there are many threats that come to the child from the perpetrator. Yeah, don't say this. Some of them use that threat. So it infill, infill, uh, in, instills a lot of fear into the child. So children suffer silently, yeah? They don't talk about it. And as caregivers, as parents, as even healthcare workers, we need to be alert. There are things that you can be able to identify that can pinpoint, yeah? That maybe this child may be sexually violated. So um, the counselor needs to believe in what the child is saying, needs to trust the child. Remember we had said that you would have started off by creating a rapport and uh, this child will be able now to free themselves, be a little bit at ease and be able to speak out in terms of what really happened to them. Then um, let the child go at his or her own pace. Listen very carefully with understanding. Don't rush the child. It is important that this counselor needs to be familiar with the protocols on counseling on children and looking at even um, issues of play therapy being very important because through play therapy, the child is able to disclose so many things, yeah? In some of the um, encounters or interactions that we've had with healthcare workers, a few have gone out of their way and been able to do some, you know, um, uh, training, on um, play therapy, and it is actually helping them be able to handle children better and understand them even as they continue offering care. Now, as I wind up, I would uh, want to um, invite uh, Grace from um, Kibera South Health Center, followed by John, who will be able to share with us 
their experience when it comes to providing care to these children, what are some of the challenges that they get down on the ground before, we, before now we open and have open discussions, questions, comments, seeing how we can be able to just support each other and be able to improve in terms of the care that we give the children. Thank you. Back to you, Nancy. Nancy. Uh, so, sorry, sorry. I, I'm assuming you're, you're talking about me, Amina. Nancy oh, was sorry, sorry. Host, the, host the show. Uh, I don't know, uh, your colleagues, are they going to speak? Elizabeth? Yes, Grace was, um, was already in. I'm not certain mm -hmm. about John. So maybe yeah. we can start with Grace. We can invite her and she can share some of the experiences that uh, yeah. she had from Kibera South Health Center. Yeah, Grace, kindly. We are eagerly to hear your experience. Okay, um, uh, my name is Alice Gori, not Grace. Oh, sorry, Alice. <laughs> sorry. It's okay. having a mixture with names. Eh? <laughs> All right. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, apologies. <laughs> it's okay, accepted. Okay, uh, as I said earlier when I was introducing myself, I work at the, uh, the Kibera South Health Center, the Tumaini Clinic, uh, in partnership with AMREF, and I'm, I'm an employee of AMREF. Now, uh, during my time of uh, dealing with children on uh, issues SGBV, it has been a uh, I should say it's a mixed emotional encounter uh, uh, because uh, you'll find that children will come to you and a majority will always come to you or will be brought to you uh, after some many days, months have passed after the ordeal or rather the violation took place. So actually what I've been experiencing at Kibera South Health Center, a majority of the cases of the children who come and report within 72 hours are usually very minimal. Most of these children are, cases are reported either past 72 hours when the caregiver or the parents realize that there is something unusual with this kid or there is something unusual with this child of mine or maybe a concerned neighbor realizes that my neighbor's child is not behaving in a manner which is uh, appropriate. So that's the time they, they would come or they would go and report at the children's office at uh, the DO at Kibera. And then the child will be brought to Kibera South. Now, what I've come to experience or learn with children is that First and foremost, you need to be very passionate when you're dealing with SGBB cases, especially when you're dealing with children. And uh, you need to make these children or make this survivor, the child, realize that you are there to help, not to inflict more pain on them from what they have been going through. And then secondly, a majority of the people who cause this harm or wrote this violation on these children are not people who are not familiar with them. Most of these people are people they know, people who they have learned to trust because of one encounter leading to another. There could be relatives in their homes, the fathers, the brothers, and uh, the neighbors who take advantage of the vulnerability of these children. Uh, just to cite an example of what I realized from last year when this COVID situation started, a majority of the cases I dealt with in 2020 from January to December, if I can briefly let, uh, bring to the 
table, most of the cases I dealt with were cases involving children below the ages of 18. And uh, a majority of these cases were being reported mostly past 72 hours, or even for the five days for ECP um, eligibility. Reasons being that I came to learn that due to the COVID impact on most families, most families lost uh, their source of incomes. So you find that a mother with daughters or with a daughter in the home started engaging their children into transactional sex so that they could be able to bring back food or money to the home so that they can be able to buy the basic necessities in the home. So you find that the moment these deals went wrong, those are the times these cases used to be reported. And then you find that a majority of these cases which were being reported, they either come when they're already pregnant and there's nothing much you can do. Like for example, looking at my reports from uh, when the pandemic was declared from, from March. Uh, we had in March 20, 2020, I had uh, 14 cases of SGBV for children from below the age of 18. And uh, the number of uh, the, the numbers who came uh, already pregnant at that time was one. These numbers kept on increasing as uh, months went by. Like uh, from uh, from uh, like July, I saw seven. Uh, there were there were seven, there were eleven cases in total. Seven were children, two already pregnant. In August, I saw 12, eight were children, two are pregnant, one went and got married. In September, there were 11 cases in total, nine were children below the age of 18, four are pregnant, one went and got married. In October, there were a total number of eight cases seen, six were children, four were pregnant. So you see the number of the children getting pregnant, just to show you that there was a lot of transactional sex taking place so that people could be able to survive, especially in the informal sector, like where I work in Kibera. Was a, a clear indication that things were not so good on the ground. So a majority of these cases were being reported when the deal went sour. So when these cases usually come, when dealing with kids, as much as we are supposed to follow the usual protocols we are supposed to follow when dealing with SGBV cases, like the, the four, let's say five Ws, which we are supposed to, to deal with, that is what, what happened, where did it happen, when did it happen, who did it, and then to a certain ex extent, why do you think it happened, which might sometimes never apply to the children. This mostly applies to the adults. So yeah. if you have... If you have these skills at hand, and you've developed that ability to be able to read the child's mind, to, to be psychologically connected to a child and be able to tell when this child is fear, fearing somebody or fearing something, when this child is not being so open to you, you'll find that dealing with kids is very interesting. And what I've learned that 85% of what the children tell us are always the truth. Yeah, except for the teenage girls and boys from the ages of 15 to 19, a majority of the time they will lie to you on the first visit, on the first encounter. When they come to visit you, they will lie to you. Again, another observation I've made during the course of this COVID time, I've uh, come across quite a number of teenagers who have in, uh, started indulging in drugs and substance abuse. Even as I'm speaking right now, I have a client at Madari Mental. She just went ballistic from the drugs she was using from last year when they were not going to school. So you find that first, she will not tell you that she's using the drugs. And if you're not patient, if you're not keen, and if you're not, and if you're not ready to dwell in depth in a gentle way, you'll never be able to know or tell that this, this child is using substance or this child is abusing substance.
happens. Then again, the number of teenagers being infected with HIV from last year is also increased. And the number of teenagers who have been on care and have been, uh, they, uh, they got it through sexual violence, a majority of them defaulted their treatment. So you find that SGBV, as much as we are looking at the sexual part of it, sexual violation part of it, other, other many issues have, have been coming up here. Thank you very much, Alice, for sharing your experience. Um, I think now we'll start taking the question and answers unless you have something extra that you want to add. I don't know if Ofula would be able to speak. Okay, uh, just before I go to the questions and answers, when we, uh, the presentation was being done at the beginning, there are certain things I noted which were mentioned, like um, we were being told that the designated persons to fill the PRC are the nurses and the clinical officers who are registered. Even the MOH also, are, uh, I think they're, they're among the people also allowed to fill up the PRC form and the P3 forms as well. And uh, another thing also I noted, forensic management. When it comes to forensic management, sometimes uh, from my experience, you'll find that when a case comes, like uh, for example, a case whereby a child is being suspected to have been using drugs or substance, or a child was drugged and then defiled. When you collect this sample, you will find that we healthcare providers uh, dealing with these cases of SGBB will collect the samples in the, in the appropriate way they're supposed to be collected. Like for example, when it comes to substance abuse, the recommended specimen to be used for toxicology is usually the urine. And we are given a timeline of 72 hours for this urine to be taken to the government chemistry for toxicology to be done so that we can be able to know exactly what kind of drug this child has been using or what kind of drug was used to drug this child and uh, he got violated sexually. But the problem comes when the persons who are allowed or rather, I don't know, I need to, I stand to be corrected. The persons who are allowed to take these samples to the government chemistry, which are the, who are the IOs, the investigating officers dealing with these particular cases. Sometimes you'll find they don't come on time to come and collect these urines or these samples, be it an HVS for DNA or a, a urine sample for toxicology. They would come when the sample is almost expiring. Like uh, for urine, uh, when the 72 hours period is almost last, uh, lasting. So you find that the forensic findings going to be found in this sample, urine sample, might not be so credible. So that when you go to court, when you go to argue and say that the, the survivors say that they, 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 they just remember, like there's a case I dealt with though she was uh, she was 18 she was turning 18 by the time the incident was happening she was drugged with a uh, with one of these drugs we usually give to these people who are in the mental institution so when i uh, requested for a urine for the urine toxicology and it was taken to the laboratory the results came back then she was she was drugged with a drug with this drug being given to sedate people in the mental institutions and apparently we had to take this sample to a private clinic because even the IO could not even come on time to collect this sample. I mean, to pick up this sample and take it to the government chemist. And that this has happened not once, not twice. So I think we need to improve on how the samples are usually collected and uh, taken to the government chemistry. That is if they are for forensic evidence to be analyzed in the laboratory. Another thing also which needs to be improved is when forensic clothing, forensic, any part of, uh, I mean, uh, any part of item which the, 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 the survivor brings to the facility and you indicate that they brought it, you'll find that uh, a majority of the time the police officer tells you, I will come for it. And they, will, they don't come, with, they, they, they never come back for them. So you find that uh, 
I have a, a whole cupboard, a whole big cupboard full of forensic but dating back to as, as late as 2008, 2013. And then the most recent ones like 2019, 2020, they're not being collected and being taken to the, to the court as the exhibits when we go to, when they go to testify, especially when the IO goes to testify and even when um, we, the healthcare provider, go to testify as uh, expert witnesses. When uh, the IO does not tell the court that there was a there was a forensic of this kind collected, you find that those items are left there, and then we don't know what to do with them because we have quite a lot of I have quite a lot of those forensic items in my cupboard in my in my room at Kibera South, and I need directive and direction on what am I going to do with them? Because mm. some of these cases, some of these cases have even been closed. Yeah, I, 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 we usually have that issue and I'm not really sure if it's because, because um, most of the, 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 like you say, this is a multidisciplinary approach. People would come, as is the medical people will take the sample, but the biggest gap, okay, from my experience is the, the, the victims or the survivors do not go to report. So that means the police do not come back to get the samples or uh, I don't know, like that, that, that's, that's usually the biggest hiccup because the police cannot come to collect samples unless somebody has reported. And there's no role for medical personnel to, to report cases. It's usually victim driven or survivor driven rather um, and uh, maybe it's something that needs to be looked into especially when it comes to children because most of the perpetrators like you said are people who they know people who they see are people who want to cover up the crime and uh, I, I really pray it it gets to be resolved uh, I, I believe John was supposed to critical. And probably yeah. we need to give uh, Dr. Wafula an opportunity yeah. to give some guidance on uh, Hello. Yeah, sorry. Yes, hello. Hi, Doc. Hi. Uh, I'd like to share my experience. Uh, from my experience, I'd like to start from the challenge that we had in 2020. Uh, most of the time, you'll find that the medic people after undergoing a training in psycholegal, I discovered we still have a gap, whereby at the moment, the modality of communication to children is so different. Many people, how they communicate to children, they don't go to their level. Uh, and you'll find that with different modalities of communication, majority of medics have not been trained. An example is the play therapy, uh, Santre. Uh, when we talk all, of all those modality of communication, uh, most people you will find in most facilities, they have not been trained on that. And at that moment, during history taking, uh, you will just capture what just the child is telling you. And that one becomes also a challenge because during the preceding follow-up, you'll find that the story changes. Another challenge we usually have, it's the aspect of confidentiality. Especially the last year, we had very many cases of pregnancy. Uh, when we come to aspect of confidentiality, which is in law, maybe an adolescent, a 14 year old comes this 14 year old is your patient. During your history taking, uh, sometimes we excuse the parent to be outside, but during the examination, that's when we allow the parent and also a chaperone. During history taking, they tell you a lot of information. You, you are required to document in the PRC form and also in the P P3. Remember the parent who brought this Adolescents will ask you what was your finding during the lab, what was your finding? An example is whereby I had a case of a 
16 year old girl who was brought by the parent after running home uh, for three weeks. She came to the medical facility during history taking, she denies everything, uh, she declines examination. Then because we know the protocol, we advise them to take a lab test. When we send them for the blood and urine test, uh, the test comes out to be HIV positive, she's pregnant, mm -hmm. and also the microscopy showed some numerous spermatozoa. So to such a uh, case, it becomes very challenging. Uh, one thing you want to maintain confidentiality because when you disclose, you don't know what the mother will do to this child when they get back home. Uh, the other thing, you don't know where you will start, whether to disclose the status to the parent or to disclose the status to the child. It becomes a challenge. Uh, when it comes to the examination, sometimes the parent will go with the examination findings that you tell them. Most of the time, they will want you to tell them exactly what you have seen. They will want you to tell them if that person has been raped. And the moment you say that the minor has been raped, they will go with that theory to the legal and everywhere. So at times when you get certain finding, you have to talk to them to tell them they can be caused by other thing. Another thing when it comes to aspect of giving medication, uh, you will find that majority don't complete their medication, don't come for follow-up, and that one is also a big challenge to us. I don't want to talk so much up to there. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. That was quite an insightful uh, experience. Um, yeah. May I say something? Yes, Ruth, I was, I was just about to come to you. Dr. Kinuthia had uh, already, yes. Yes, uh, sorry, Professor. Yes. Go <laughs> Good evening. Mm -hmm. uh, good evening to everybody. Um, this is always a tragic topic to discuss uh, sexual, a sexual assault of uh, children. Um, there, are, there are avenues of, uh, um, as long as we are, uh, apply that these are children, these 14, 15 year olds, 13 year olds, or younger. The, under the Children's Act, there are strategies for actually um, protecting this child. And um, when you see this child, this is a matter that should be reported. And um, every chief's office or DO's office has an officer called a children's officer. Mm. Are trained, they are actually trained officers. They are people who can actually um, stand for the child and even have a child committed to, to, to be protected away from an environment where they are being um, sexually abused. So I think it is not right to say that there's nothing we can do for these youngsters. There is. The structures are there. We are just mm. not, we are not using them. Um, the, the, when, when the case that you report, yes, the, cha the, the challenge of uh, the, the normal principle of uh, at addressing a child who's abused, uh, you need to gauge whether it is the mother was a participant in the abuse or not. As you've pointed out rightly, there are women who sent, who are taking their, who are using their children as sex workers, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, in, and in the, they just fight in the, on the basis of, of poverty. This is actually child abuse. If a situation like that, if you have a situation like that, that child actually needs to be separated from that home and be in a protected environment. And that's why you must report. When you don't report, when, do, when you don't call in the necessary officers, your social worker to do the, the, the more detailed history, the, 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 the children's officers who may commit this child to actually to a, a, even a, 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 first of all, depending on how, how the, the youngster is, you may need to admit them into hospital and then um, a process, uh, pro process their, um, through the children's department so that they get the necessary protection. If you don't do that, um, they'll just be back in the same space and for the ones who are very who come in very traumatized, if you don't deal with it, they'll be dead in that year or so. So I think there is enough structure, there are enough laws to start a process of protecting them. I think we as health workers, um, 
uh, as health workers are not using the instruments that they are, they are enough. Having said that, the relatives of an individual who has assaulted a girl know that if they are under the, the if they are over 18 years, this person is in a lot of trouble if the girl is under 18 years. The families actually gang up against the family of the child who is uh, the girl who has been assaulted. They, they, they will threaten them. Um, and the girl's family uh, are frightened because they feel if this young man is arrested and put into jail and lo and behold, if he dies in jail, they are held responsible for what has, that has happened. So at the end of the day, the girl is the most vulnerable People sacrifice her, so to say, and and so uh, so the, so there are challenges, and the health workers actually participate by not not having started the process, the correct process of protecting this child, even away from their family, at the point of um, when things were were happening. When it is very very prevalent, um, one time we were running a study where we found ninety percent of the kids coming in at the couple counselling were thirteen and fourteen year olds then you have to actually involve the whole community to address that issue. The chief, the parents, the local church, the people who are supposed to normally protect the youngsters. It shouldn't be that a child is going through this kind of abuse and there's nobody else to protect them. Yeah, um, let me stop there. Thank you very much, Professor. And I agree with you. Okay. I've, I've, I've had several encounters with children, not just sexually abused, but physically abused as well. It's, it's still part of violence. And uh, for me, the quickest solution, especially if it's at night, is admit the patient and mark it to the social worker. The advantage we have in KNH, we always have a social worker on call. So we turn the case to them. And um, on follow-up, I believe they are usually put in the right structure. So you're right, the structures are there, but not a lot of people are aware uh, how to use it. Even if there's no indication for, in, for admission at times, that's the indication. Uh, maybe- uh, 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 just, just before you continue, could I please yeah. make a clarification in regards to what uh, the I, I, I don't know if it was a doctor or the professor said earlier. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yes. Basically, and ideally what I know with these uh, cases of sexual gender-based violence, when these survivors come to you or when they're brought to you, first and foremost, you need to take a consent from the caregiver who has brought this, uh, this survivor to you so that by the end of the day, whatever you're going to be doing, you are protected and covered because you are given permission to do this thing. What am I trying to refer to? For example, I have a 14 year old or a child who is below 15. And by law, we are told that there are certain tests you cannot carry out on a child without getting a consent from the caregiver or the person who is in charge of this kid. Like for example, the HIV test. And when, when you want to do this kind of test on this or carry out this kind of test on these young survivors, it is always prudent to explain to them, run them through and let them know exactly why are we doing all this and why is it very important for us to do this. Like um, when I'm dealing with children below the ages of 15, whom I know by bylaws, I cannot carry out an HIV test on them without being authorized because should this test come out positive, you love to do a lot of explanation. and. Uh, from my experience, when I, I, whenever I've been dealing with these kids, I've always tried to explain to the caregiver or the parent or whoever has brought this kid in the simplest language possible for them to be able to understand. Why are we doing all these things? We don't have to go, go into the deeper medical part aspect of it and uh, start making these people get even more confused. Like the, the issue of PEP within 72 hours, because the, the, the community is informed. So when they come, they'll ask you, uh, won't you give them something to prevent them from getting um, infected with HIV? You'll have to explain to them and tell them if this, uh, pass, if this child qualifies for PEP, if this child qualifies for ECP, yeah? When I'm carrying out these tests, there are mm -hmm. possibilities of one, two, three happening. And 
they have a right also to ask you what the test results are as much as you're not going to give out the uh, the results for them to go around out there in the community to show each and every person, especially with the teenagers. If they told you that they don't want their parents to be told if they're pregnant or they're HIV positive and the like, now there comes a, a situation whereby you have to be very tactical on how you're going to handle it because at the end of the day, the parents have to be involved. And Mark, you remember when you're dealing with these children, when, you ex when the child is narrating to you whatever has been happening to them, as healthcare workers, we are not just there to get narrations on, on uh, what, the kind of abuse, the sex, uh, uh, in this case, the sexual abuse this child has been going through. We are also supposed to psychologically examine this kid and emotionally. Mm -hmm. Very important accepts because when you go to court to present these cases, there is that part of how was the demeanor of this child when you first met this child and even when you progressively dealt with this child to, till the day you are bonded to go to court as an expert witness to go and give your evidence. So these are some of the challenges. Some of us healthcare providers don't look it at the very critical. That's why you'll find that a, a very good case thrown out because somebody did not indicate the demeanor of this child when they first met the child. <laughs> the part B of the PRC, they never bothered to fill it, fill it up or rather even mention it if this child and, and, I mean, went through psychosocial counseling and any form of other counseling and uh, what has been happening to this child. Let me give a good example. Today I was in court for a case of 2016, right? Now mm -hmm. this girl, by the time she came, she was still very young and she didn't even understand herself. She was around 15 years old, heading to 16. So she was in a Romeo and Juliet relationship with a guy who was 18 and she was 15. She got pregnant. So in the process of me narrating and giving the evidence of what she went through, what we did, I had also to capture the parts whereby this girl even refused to go back to school after she got pregnant. The guy was, or rather the man, the young man was confusing her. And as we speak, she has ran back to that guy after getting the baby. And uh, you see, this is a, 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 this is a young lady who is putting herself into a situation whereby eventually she's going to experience IPV because she got married to this guy just because she thinks that once you get pregnant, the person who impregnates you must marry you. So when you go to court, as much as this PRC, you see, most of the time when you get these cases of sexual uh, of uh, teenagers who have been violated sexually and they're already pregnant, the PRC seems to be like it's very short. But the sh that that that, that uh, appearance of like it's very short, it is very important for you to be able to say and indicate the demeanor of this survival on first arrival, the demeanor of this survival on subsequent arrival. Were we improving? Was there, was there any improvement? If there was, yes. If there wasn't, no. What did we do after that? Another case in a case scenario. I have a 13 year old girl who has been using drugs from last year during COVID time. Eh? And mm. then now this, the gun she has joined in Kibera, they, they, this drug, they call it what, CDC and D something like that. That's what I was being told. Mm -hmm. The first day that this girl came, I realized something was not right with, the, with this girl. From the way she was talking, her speech was loud and, uh, and uh, she kind of like, she was not herself and she, she wasn't even ready to be examined at the beginning. So like we say, you don't rush them. Let her calm down and then see the importance of you wanting to, to examine her. This is a child who was brought by the father. Already you see there is a problem here. I ask, where is the mother? Mama mepeleka atoto shule. So nikasema ni sawa. So I took my time in the process of uh, my counselor whom we were working with, talking to her to find out why was she in such a mellow mood, me, 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 mellow mood, like somebody do is, uh, you know, when you take substance and when you take alcohol, you just become mellow. And it was morning at around 10, 11. Uh, Kambia, the counselor, she has been using, um, what did she call it? Ndukulu. Ndukulu mm -hmm. is bad here. Yeah. So, so, so the counselor like, well, how, how did you start using this thing? I can say my dad introduced me to it. You see? Mm -hmm. Now she's opening up 
hours later, when you're dealing with kids, like I said at the beginning, you really have to be patient. Mm. It's no hurry because if you if you rush, you'll miss out a lot of things. So she said the father introduced her to this. Then she got a boyfriend who is introduced her to what is called tap tap. Now, as we're speaking right now, she came back again on a, on a date, not the day I'd given her to come back. So she came to tell me, Dr. Me, you told me to come on 17th, but me, me kuja leo tare kumi because nilisikia dadia kisema na peleko. But the way she was talking, I could see that this girl, she's still using the same substance she's been using. And uh, uh, about the children's office, we worked very close with, I, I, I personally worked very close with the children's department at Kibera Dio. Whenever I get any, any case involving a child, I have to inform them and I have to request and tell the parent or whoever has brought this child, please go and report at the children's office. A majority of the time, most parents do not go because, because of the frustration they have had or they, they have been through when these cases go to court and the many, many months and years these cases take, you find a parent that says, I can report it. I can see that you have to report it. I can see that you So you see that mentality. Then, if they don't do that, they get out of that place and go and have an alternative dispute resolution. Forgetting that with kids, we are not supposed to have that, but it is happening. So we are we, we, we are really having a big challenge and we need to do something about it. The ADR is the norm. The kids will be brought for, for the PEP, ECP, and then wakitoka inje, next time ukipiga simu, mwana muku kuja appointment, ah, tulimpeleka ushago, there is no ushago anapelekwa. The perpetrator's families meet with the survivor's family, uko kando, and uh, the settle cases. So what uh, what uh, what we thought of, uh, could be the best thing to do? We need to uh, empower CHVs because they are they are our eyes and they are our connection to the community. And I must say, uh, they have really been of help to me because I do not know most of the homes where these uh, survivors come from, or even where these perpetrators come from. But you'll find that if you've got that good network mm. with the other CBOs and other people in the community, you'll get to learn a lot. Because like me, you see like this case of this girl who's using drugs. The person who, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, the person who dragged her and raped her that night before she was brought to me is a well-known tag in Kibera. This is from information I was getting from the community champions and the people on the grassroots. So you find like, if you bring these people very close to you and you show them that you're here to, uh, to help them, you are not here just to, to work, go home, they will give you a lot of information. And I must appreciate that the Kibera people, if you work very close with them and you show them that you're out to help them, you will get a lot of information as much as, as, as at times me. Me, myself, I've been threatened by I mean, uh, families of the perpetrators when cases come to me and they know that I'm the one who's dealing with the, a particular case. But because of the network I've, I've, I've uh, created with the community, you will just yeah. feel safe when you're working there. Thank you very much, Alice. And uh, I thank you for the work. You are helping a lot of unfortunate people. And uh, I know you might get compassion fatigue at times hold your own we're here to also support you um there's a question here from professor lemma that i would uh, love to be addressed it's about um, self-blame attitude which comes from results of uh, having sexually abused how do you deal with that if uh, how do you mitigate it anybody would like to tackle that question Hello, Doc. Yes. Uh, let me answer Professor Valentino from the experience that we have shared from other countries. Yeah. Uh, most of the time you find self-blaming. Uh, we need to reverse this because we want this person by the time they get into adulthood, they understand what they underwent and they are able to live a normal life. Uh, there is a tool called Adverse Childhood Experience. 
that tool captures information such as that one uh, aspect of being abused. And when you use such a tool, you want this child to understand it was not their fault. And also you want to walk the journey that is psychosocial support. Uh, we usually do, we usually have like for 10 months. Every month you meet these clients, you try to revert that so that by the time they get into adulthood, they're able to live a normal life. Unfortunately, in Kenya, we don't have camps. Other countries like, for example, Canada, they have Zebra Center, whereby it's a place where you will go, it's like a school. Uh, they will try to revert those effects of child abuse. And they will do an assessment. After you qualify, they will send you. An example is, I'll tell the professor to watch on YouTube. Uh, uh, on YouTube, there's, uh, there's a clip by a doctor from US called Child of Rage. If you watch Child of Rage, you will understand now how you can reverse those behaviors. The other one I'd like her, if she's able to, in a position to watch is removed. If you watch removed part one to three, I think that one will answer her very well. The two, child with rage and removed. Thank you. Yeah. So we have Dr. Wafula. Thank you very much for that. We'll definitely look at those links. Dr. Wafula, yeah, Dr. Wafula, can you kindly speak? Hello. Uh Yes. I just wanted to say uh, thank you for the presenters and the discussion. Um, my comment, I really appreciate the conversation. My comment is just in regard to the concerns that are being raised on currency and um, evidence from custody and the, the experiences on the ground. It means it's a um, self and we are the program. We are having conversations around strengthening that. But we do hope that in the follow-up series, this which we uh, discussed, we will focus really on forensic management and uh, the, the whole chain of custody. And we have great part of the to, to kind of build up that we have to address our, our challenge. Secondly, uh, one of the things we've identified as a program that is a, a, a capacity issue, but also an implementation issue, is the clarity by healthcare workers on the front of the way as first responders. So, Legally, we are the first responders to these children, and we are governed by two things, that the interest of the child is priority, is paramount, is central to everything we do, and that we are uh, uh, bound by the Hippocratic Oath to do no harm. So uh, we're increasingly seeing a challenge in the issue of psychosocial support when you as a healthcare worker, you can tell that the mother or the people who brought this child are actually conniving in this whole violence thing and maybe have just brought the child because of injuries. It will be inappropriate and against all that we know as healthcare workers to release that child into the same hands. So uh, one of the things we are reviewing, and uh, I hope in the next series we'll direct, delve deeply into the issue of psychosocial support, both within the health sector and how we support the other sectors for children who have experienced violence, is the question of should we just have it clear in our guideline that unless certain things are satisfied for children who are experiencing sexual violence, we shouldn't release them from our hands. So we are looking at our guidelines, and um, this is a topic that we can discuss deeper, including what uh, John has raised. I think we had a stakeholder meeting, he was there, and we are asking ourselves, should we set up butterfly centers or whatever centers we call them, so that we can support these children, because we know there is now evidence that if we don't correctly deal with this violation in childhood, we are dealing with problems in the future, as we know the SE studies and the evidence we have. So yes, we are looking into that space, and uh, we hope that in the future series, we'll have a detailed discussion with, on what we are doing for psychosocial support, but also what we are thinking in the future and uh, we work a, a solution to, to the children. But otherwise, um, thank you for the conversation. 
Thank you, Dr. Ari, for your comment. Um, Jessica Sidika, you had asked questions. Maybe you can unmute and ask, uh, ask them live. Yeah, thank you very much for giving me a, a, a chance to talk. First of all, uh, this uh, topic usually traumatizes me more. I think uh, doctors get traumatized so much, uh, especially when it comes to imaging. Uh, it is through imaging that some of the violence, uh, sexual violence was revealed to the clinician. Because some of the children, you came to me either in Gertrude's or at Kenyatta, and uh, the complaint was repeated urinary tract infection because the child was complaining that if I pass urine, I feel pain. Uh, and for boys, it would be stool incontinence. A boy is just okay, and then all of a sudden he starts having stool incontinence and uh, constipation. So those two things in the medical cycles, I think should be investigated properly. And uh, because uh, most children, whenever they came for imaging, I would talk to them nicely, kindly, and they accept to have the procedure done. But I could see those with the recurrent abuses, sexual abuse, especially girls. They are so keen in lying down very fast, opening their legs. And you know, once they do that, they expose you to seeing the damage that has been done over time. And when you talk to them and you say that, I would like to do this procedure, can, you, can I allow your parents to go out? And when the parents go out, the child now tells you the truth. What has been happening? Because when you ask them questions and say, but who has been fiddling with you here? And who has been doing something in your anus? And they tell you who the person is and uh, what they have done. My problem was how to communicate that information to the parents. And uh, most of the times I didn't do communicate to the parents. I would tell parents my findings and everything else, but I used to call the clinician and tell the clinician there is sexual abuse here you better look into it. And the clinician would be telling me, hey, Dr. Wambani, how will I disclose that to these people? The mother is, uh, I don't know, a PS, or the mother is an, a senior person, or the mother is, you know, or the parent is like this, how will I disclose this? And in, term, in some cases, you will find that it's actually the father who is doing it, started off with the fingers for the girl, even the boys, they are sodomized by their, 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 own, their own father. And uh, this is something that uh, is very traumatic. And I think we should not only look at the healthcare aspect of it, we should be under the police and whatever, and putting in systems on how we should, uh, uh, you know, uh, take these people to court and so on. We should look at the community level. What are we missing in the community that is leading to all these big figures that are going up, 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 up? up? I think we should. Uh, Dr. Ari, we have lost you. Hello. Um, so thank you. Dr. Okay, you had muted. Oh, sorry. You had muted me. Yeah, so sorry. Anyway, sorry those, are my comments. those are my comments that uh, yeah. we should, uh, yeah. it's very traumatic and uh, we should know how to, you know, give the information back to parents because in some cases it's, one of the parents who is, uh, you know, at fault. And, uh, you know, it's very difficult uh, to deal with that. So, yeah, you know, those are my comments. And uh, I think um, when you receive a child with the repeated uh, urinary tract yeah. infection and uh, also stool incontinence, 
those mm. are the key things that medical people should look at, especially pediatricians. And uh, more so, it's very difficult to examine a girl, child, as a pediatric, you know, nine year old as a mm. pediatric, uh, as a pediatrician, but have it in your mind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, it goes without say under understatement that we do in not recognizing the role of imaging in, in gender-based violence. There are many cases, especially foreign bodies who end up getting surgeries and what have you. In fact, there's a case study Dr. Walong had written on a child who everybody missed even it was discovered during postpartum that the child had gonorrhea which is very difficult to treat um, at that age group. So there's a lot of uh, missed diagnosis or rather we miss sexual abuse. And uh, you're right, we should have a very high index of suspicion with, with kids who are coming with UT chronic UTIs, chronic abdominal pains that we've treated with everything and it's not going away. So that index of suspicion is really, really required. Uh, for the interest of time, I, 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 do any of the panelists want to have a parting message? I'm sorry we, we, are, we are unable to do the question and answer session today, but uh, I can see there are some questions on forensics which will be deal which will be discussed in the next session next week by Dr. Afula. Maybe I make an observation. Um, uh, uh, Amina. Yes. I, I, I think the important thing is that there are protocols for handling a, a child coming in who has been sexually abused. And the, what Dr. Fuller has emphasized is that releasing a child back to a family which is abusing her does not help. It just allows for it to continue and to get worse. Let's not, let us not be afraid to admit children in, in hospital to protect them mm -hmm. and to facilitate that uh, process of uh, bringing them under the, uh, the, um, the care of the state, so to say. Yeah. The, 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 if you have any suspicion, this is what should be done. Um, the, the speaker who's talked about informed consent for HIV testing and uh, when you have a child in front of you who is abused. Um, I think the, 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 the protocols there now, you know, if you are the parent who's abusing this child, you are to a certain extent now abdicating that responsibility of giving consent because you are the, the one who's harming the child. So such a child actually needs to be admitted so that you can sort out through that whole process of who, 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 what the test, how the testing is done, and how that process goes forward, and that applies also for the uh, for the pregnancy. In the old days, used to have the Elderville homes. There was a home next to one of those um, one of those facilities in the, near Huruma, where it would be a home for girls who are pregnant and who are being rejected by family until they deliver, because you need antenatal care. You're pregnant, you need antenatal care like anybody else, in addition to the psychosocial support. My last mm -hmm. one is that long studies that go for 30 years show that individuals who get sexually assaulted as young people go on to have mental health problems in their adulthood. So mm -hmm. this is a problem we must work on. It's, uh, it's been around for a long time, uh, but you must create the spaces for safety for these youngsters. And we must stop calling what sets work, you know, because this is, it, it validates it. It validates yeah. putting your daughter out there to do, to, to be sexually abused. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think um, maybe I just have one question. We have mentioned about um, the utilization of PEP post uh, abuse. How, do we have any data showing us if there are people who are actually seroconverting post rape? I don't know if that if that's available. I've never seen that data. 
yes, um, I can I can jump in and just say that yes, we do have data, but uh, especially from our routine DHIS data, we do have numbers of mm -hmm. those who said that after four four weeks of follow up, based on the follow up that uh, Liz talked about. But as you mm -hmm. realize, well, that number does not represent the correct number because the follow-up is most only 25% probably complete. The, but out of that 25%, we do get the numbers. Yes, we do have, even pregnancies, we do have the numbers. Nice, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Uh, all the a lot of uh, sexual violence in children. I believe the take home message today is enough so emergency situation. The first thing is not even the vital sign when somebody mentions that they're sexually abused or what they need phys psychological support as soon as possible. That's the emergency. That's the emergency treatment to feel safe and supported. And um, I believe next week, Dr. Rose will take us through the forensic part of the series. Uh, it will address most of the questions which were asked today. Thank you very much for joining. Um, be champions of observing peculiar behaviors in children and uh, let's be there for them. Thank you. Have a good, have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.